So I'm here to talk to you about my project, uh, Crowdsourcing Neighborhoods Using Open Source Tools. Um, make sure that's all good. First, I want to talk about why do I care about neighborhoods, or why should you care about neighborhoods? Um, first of all, we all live in a neighborhood. We all have a sort of a personal connection and traverse it day to day. And that's quite an important thing. So our personal understanding of our neighborhood differs from person to person, even within households or between partners across the board. Um, there's also no one definition for what a neighborhood is. It sort of is used to fit the purpose. Um, but for our own, ex our own experiences, it varies quite a lot. Um, neighborhoods are also used for a lot of operational purposes. So if you think of stuff like addressing models or dissemination of results or um, emergency response, using the neighborhood as a polygon or a boundary is quite important for a range of purposes. So my research questions sort of what's guiding my research, and these have changed about 10 times throughout the process, but these are hopefully final. Um, so I'm interested in what personal characteristics impact neighborhood donations. So if you think of stuff like age or gender or how long you've lived in a neighborhood, does that impact the size of it, the perimeter, the actual boundary itself? I'm also interested in thinking about where does one neighborhood end and where does one begin? So I don't know if everyone had the, the concept where you're driving along the street and you're sort of thinking, where does this one neighborhood start? Where does one begin? Is it where the sign is that says, welcome to Brooklyn? Where is it welcome to Wellington? Or is it another arbitrary point? The answer is probably neither, but hopefully I can find that out. Um, I'm also interested in looking at how to crowdsource or community neighborhoods, how do they compare to the official boundaries? So the fire, fire emergency have a locali localities data set, which are the official data sets for neighborhoods in New Zealand. So in th terms of things like the size or the actual boundary, how well do these official boundaries represent how we perceive our neighborhoods? I'm also looking at what geographic features, so things like roads or rivers or tunnels or green space, inform neighborhood boundaries. Um, a lot of research has been done on this, but not at the scale that I'm hoping to do it at across an entire city rather than a single suburb or a single neighborhood. And finally, is crowdsourcing a viable method for gathering neighborhood data? So a lot of it has done sampling or on small scales, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, so drawing neighborhood boundaries, a lot of this has been done quite a lot since the 1960s. Um, they've often been done in a single neighborhood in person on paper maps. So example here is a census unit in Cleveland, which had 20 participants. Um, so they went there, had people draw the neighborhoods and then digitize them. And you think about the amount of work that would be for an entire city. That's why I opted not to do that. Another example was um, in downtown Santa Barbara, and they had 36 participants, and they got these by standing on a street corner in the street, just, hey, fill up my survey. <laughs> not too keen on doing that. But um, through the internet, hopefully, I can reach much more people much easier. Um, Crowdsourcing neighborhoods. So VGI, if you wanted geographic information, is cleared for, by the general public for a range of purposes. Um, a range of methods are used to collect VGI, and they're either active, and I'll give some examples. So one, if you're from New Zealand, you're very aware of the GeoNet felt it report, but for everyone who's not from New Zealand, it's a, every time there's an earthquake, you head up GeoNet and you say if you felt the earthquake and what intensity, and that plots it. Um, it's also OpenStreetMap, OpenStreetMap we're all aware of. It's also the Great Kerudu Count, which is a, it's a survey run for a week in September and asked people to cite um, Kerudu, which are New Zealand's native wood pigeon. Um, they're quite beloved and were bird of the year 2018. Um, that's a great example because it's sort of getting the community involved and in thinking about their environment and mapping solutions. And again, bird of the year. It's not so much <laughs> a VGI, but it's sort of like a crowdsourcing voting system. And I'm all for the hoi ho winning this year. <laughs> it's also a lot of passive data collection from VGI. And this often takes the form of um, uh, geotagged social media posts. So if you think about the amount of posts that are happening across the world. If you were to harvest these, turning these to points, sort of infer different things. It's also uh, GPS tracking, which is quite a lot. Um, benefits of crowdsourcing, you can reach a wide population quite easily, and removes the need for sampling, which is quite a laborious process. There are some drawbacks, uh, mainly data quality. When putting out to the general public, people are gonna do weird, crazy stuff, so a lot of processes need to monitor that. Lack of metadata is also an issue. Um, Self-selection bias is something that's quite a problem from my thing, which is the problem that so people filling a survey, I have no way of quantifying who they are. They live in the neighborhood. 
So if one person could fill in it 10 times and I'm too sure if those are all valid responses. There's also an urban bias, which is that VGI is primarily produced in urban areas. And without funding, which I didn't get any of, will anyone give me data? Um, <laughs> but when I was looking to launch something that could gather responses, I wanted it to be like quite simple, but quite flexible in terms of me programming it. Um, I looked in some solutions, which included an ArcGIS Online web app, um, which could have been okay, but it wasn't to the right extent that I wanted. There's also a software company called Mapgenaire, which is, runs in Finland. It's sort of a simple questionnaire um, mapping software, but I had to pay for it. I wasn't keen on doing that. There's also Esri have a thing called Geoforms, which would have been perfect, but they only work on points, and I was <laughs> interested in polygons. So those weren't the solution. And I ended up looking, kind of making my own website using open source solutions. So um, I started off taking code from a project in Boston called Bostonography, and they do a bunch of cool visualizations in this and that, but they do one project called Hoods, and their code is on GitHub, so I sort of took that as a base and used it into what I need, and I used a lot of leaflets drawing function, <coughs> Node.js, I used Flask, my web, web framework, and Mapbox, my base map. It was my first time making a website, and I very much pieced it together. So when something worked, I was like, cool. But looking back, it was pretty, <laughs> it's like Frankenstein stitched together. Um, so yeah, ended up website called wellyhoods.com. Um, and the data collection sort of occurred in three processes because I was interested in three separate things. So first of all, you draw the neighborhood boundary and that'd be, it's very simple. And then afterwards you can sort of move the vertices to change it as you will. I was also interested in other aspects of neighborhoods um, rather than the boundary. I was interested in the focal points so if you think about what the focal point might mean to you, it's going to vary for a lot of people. It might, might be their house, but it might be the shops, or it might be their church. Um, then there's also a short questionnaire at the end, which asked some questions about them, um, transport choices, how long you've lived there, stuff that will be used later on. Um, I mentioned the custom base map. I used Mapbox to make this. So I was looking for a base map that didn't have a neighborhood label, because if you're labeling where the neighborhood is, you're going to create implicit bias. I started with, um, can't see very well, that's Stamen's Toner, which is a nice base map. It was a bit harsh, so I ended up with something that's a bit nicer. The screen doesn't show it that well. but So the green space and is a lot lighter and there's no neighborhood labels. Um, so my data collection ran for three months. I got 920 responses, even without any money spent. 886 were usable. Some of them, a lot of them were quite bad for reasons you can expect. We can give people a, a blank canvas, they can draw some bad stuff, but these are the actual responses for Wellington. Um, so even then, I know a lot of people aren't here from Wellington, but you can sort of see some quite clear boundaries forming based on the amount of overlap. Um, some of the street networks, some areas that aren't considered part of neighborhoods. So if you look down there, um, that's a suburb called Island Bay, which is right at the south of Wellington. And these are the polygons for there. And there's the aerial imagery. You can see a lot of people chose to include the island, which is what the suburb is named after, but a lot of people didn't. And I thought that was quite interesting. It's a pretty even split between what sort of features are informing neighborhood boundaries. Um, it's also the CBD there. That had quite a pronounced gridding effect from streets. So a lot of the neighborhood boundaries sort of form the streets themselves. Um, you also have Kelvin and the Botanical Gardens. Closer. So it's kind of hard to capture the Botanical Gardens. But <laughs> A lot of the boundaries ended where the botanical started, but a lot of them didn't. And it's sort of, how does green space impact that? And the final one that I want to point out right now is um, Karori. So Karori is quite a large suburb at the back of Wellington. And you can see there's not much consensus around some strong borders compared to a lot of the other ones. And I thought that was quite interesting. Um, at that point, and these are the focal points as well. So the points as well. So. Before my analysis, I opted for a lot of open source tools. Um, so I did all my programming in Python, which is what that's showing. I also use R, QGIS, and Latex for writing my thesis, which is quite awesome for like figure placement. I don't know if anyone's had the problem with like Word when you try and place an image, and it just doesn't work. Latex was, was godsend for that, but it was a bit of a learning curve. A lot of my programming was done in GeoPandas. There wasn't like an image for GeoPandas, so I kind of made one myself. <laughs> 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 so <laughs> if, if GeoPandas want to contact me, I can license this out. But <laughs> <laughs> so GeoPandas was pretty much a lot of what I did was using that, and it was quite awesome, quite simple to use. Um, OSMX was great for getting road data from OpenStreetMap and some network analysis. Then I also used Tidyverse and R for a lot of my plots, uh, Linz Data Service, and OpenStreetMap as data sources. So one of the first analysis that I produced was looking at levels consensus. And this is 
quite a lot of information right now, but I'll break it down. So first of all, I laid a grid of hexagons about 60 meters wide across all of Wellington. And for each of them, I found the total number of neighborhoods that intersected it, and then the most common based on the name. And if you divide them, you can get a ratio of consensus. So the darker colors indicate that this is, a lot of people agree that this is a neighborhood, whereas the lighter colors are less so. And you can sort of see some of the clear distinctions between the neighborhoods. So where the roads are or where the elevation is, or the CBD, there's a lot less, I can't really point to it, but the CBD up there, there's a lot less consensus if that's the CBD versus one of the neighborhoods, for example. And I ignored any that didn't have, uh, had less than five neighborhood, it's sort of like a threshold value. So I didn't get nonsense balance. Um, and then looking at the personal characteristics, so previous findings have found that gender, age, and length of residence have like a significant impact on neighborhood size. So I was interested to see if these were re replicated and if stuff like transport impacted it. So I performed um, linear regression. There's like a lot of numbers, but I'll explain it a bit more. So you can see age and gender, both of them had non-significant values. So that the findings that age and gender had significant impact on neighborhood size weren't significant. Um, the amount of years you've lived in your neighborhood and the <coughs> neighborhood type, so if it was like a single or like a multiple neighborhood, had a significant impact. And it's quite a positive relationship. So the longer you've lived in your neighborhood, the larger your neighborhood began, or sorry, the size was, which is what you expect, but it was quite a cool significant finding. And also the transport, so the amount of days you use each of the four modes of transport, they were all significant, with car access being highly significant. And the plot's there, but you can see the days used on the bottom, so that's how many days in an average week people use motor transport, and that's the area on the left. So for cars, the, there's a significant increase, but for walking, it was the opposite effect. In yellow, mostly, it was a decrease, which is sort of the opposite effect for walking and cars, and that can be explained by people in cars might experience more of the neighborhood, but also it might be sort of urban bias, so people in the city don't have cars and then delineate smaller neighborhoods versus rural people. Um, I was also interested in comparing neighborhoods to official boundaries. So in black, uh, the fire services official suburbs boundaries and the red are mine. Um, you can also see some, some areas where there is some overlap between them. So for example, down here, they seem to match quite well. But I was interested in some other things. So I was using, I'm using a measure of congruence as a thing. Um, to compare them, which is the intersection between the two polygons divided by the union, and from zero they're completely opposite, and one, the boundary is completely alike. But for this neighborhood, which is in Brooklyn, um, you're getting congruence of 0 0.18, which is a bit strange because they look quite similar. But then when you look at the good picture, the big picture, they're very different. But sort of that raises the question of how, how representative is the black polygon of people's experiences, because they're obviously very different by that weird one pathway going out to a whole other area. For the focal points, I clustered them. I was interested in if they clustered around any specific features. Um, so everything in red there were significant clusters, and everything in black were non-significant. Um, for example, in Brooklyn, which is the suburb I've just shown, if you zoom in there, you can't see super well, but that's like the neighborhood shops, for example. And that was the most common cluster, the neighborhood sort of main shopping center where you find your dairy or takeaways and stuff. But for neighborhoods that didn't have a shopping center, where were people putting their focal points? Sort of more of an interesting question. For example, up in Wilton, which is the North Wellington, doesn't have a really official uh, shopping center. But when you zoom in, a lot of people have put it near the school. I can't see quite well, but a lot of people put it near the school or near the park or near the house. Seem to be some of the common options. But then another example was um, Lyle Bay, which is in South of Wellington as you had a significant cluster, but doesn't have a really official shopping area. But when you zoom in, people put it by the beach, which kind of makes sense because it's Lyle Bay, but it's quite a cool finding. Um, if anyone doesn't know, Lyle Bay is quite a lovely beach. Um, and yeah, that's my progress so far. Any questions? Okay, so we've got a few minutes for questions. Anybody want to get started? Hey, thanks. It's a really. Uh, it's not. It's, it's just being recorded. Okay. It's a really interesting talk. Thanks. Um, 
My question was with the Brooklyn example. Yeah. Did you look at the residential polygons versus the entire suburban boundary? Would that have given a better congruence with the Sorry, people's... Sorry, So this one you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like the Lynn's um, residential polygons? Yeah. Would that have given a better yeah, so that's, correspondence? Yeah, so that's something I've, I've included as well. So this was just one example of localities showing it, but yeah. I've also done analysis for the residential and the stats area too, which yeah. is the new stats boundaries. So obviously which are more representative mm. of people's experiences, yeah. Hi, um, have you recorded the um, kind of the perceived map literacy of the, um, the people who completed the survey and also um, the demography of the survey? I mean, if it's online based, mm. then you will capture certain demography yeah. and neglect the others. Do you yeah. take that into account? Uh, yeah. Um, so I mostly got, because it's web based, most of the sample were younger people, as you would expect. Um, and it's something that I'm looking to do at the moment. I'm quite early in my analysis at the moment, but I'm looking to sort of sample by the different demographics I got, yeah. Um, were there any patterns in um, the areas that people drew lines along? Like, were they geographic barriers? Or? Yeah, um, so a lot of them, if I maybe go back, to maybe to this one. Um, so a lot of the areas people drew lines on were main roads, so like main arterial routes were the most common one. Um, another cool example might be down here where I showed. That right there is the airport, and the airport is quite like a hard boundary, so a lot of people drew that as like the boundary for their suburb, which sort of reflects the, the official boundary per se, yeah. But the, the main thing so far have been roads or um, tunnels were quite a strong one. So I don't know if I can point it out, but tunnel up here, it's um, the Mount Victoria Tunnel. And if you go back to uh, this one here, that's quite a clear point where like free neighborhoods sort of end, because it's quite a hard boundary that you traverse through and you sort of change neighborhoods and also causes ones to end, for example. Did you maybe um, look at how many nodes people are placing to work out, to try and work out is how much effort they're putting into yeah. it, whether it's just roughly yeah. sketching it out? So, one analysis I've done, so this is just on the area, but I've also performed this on number of vertices or the length or the complexity of the neighborhood. Um, and it was a lot less than the official boundaries. If you think about number of vertices in like a curve versus a lot of people did, it was a lot less. But it, it's quite hard to tell because I didn't ask any questions on that. It was sort of you filled out my survey and that was it. But it would have been cool to capture if you filled out on your cell phone or on a desktop PC, for example, or how long you spent filling it out to sort of gauge the effort people put, people, people put into it, yeah. per se, yeah. Um, so if you were to uh, redo the questions, for example, what's some yeah. data you would have also liked to get? Yeah, so something I've thought about a lot, actually. So <laughs> one thing I would love to capture is if people owned their house, versus if they didn't, and also if you were a student versus if you um, were working full time. Because that's been done before. It's those two things, and also if you completed it on a mobile versus desktop. Um, a, lot of the other, a lot of the other ones I'm quite happy with, especially the transport ones. And as far as I'm aware, that's a, that's a new finding. But yeah, mainly housing type and job status would have been quite good. With the questionnaire, we were quite careful, because it's a VGI and a crowdsourcing, to not scare people away. So not asking any personal questions about where do you live or how much do you earn. Because then immediately people would have seen that and be like, oh, screw this. So it was quite a balancing out between asking, asking questions that were interesting, but also weren't overbearing, if that makes sense. Right. I have time for one more question, if anyone's. Have you shared your feedback with Fire and Emergency? I haven't yet. Um, currently writing my thesis, so hopefully they'll see that and just can read that. <laughs> <laughs>